So um, just to save us some time, uh, let me just get straight uh, to the presentation. Um, the topic of my talk is uh, religious environmental humanism as means to promote environmental sustainability, uh, Buddhist and Confucian approaches. So some of, of the things uh, on Buddhism might um, sort of uh, be similar to what uh, yeah. your, your presentation. Uh, so environmentalism based on uh, religious sources are uh, often described as uh, anthropocentric. And we know that in the field of environmental ethics, the term anthropocentric or anthropocentrism is the, almost a dirty word. It often conjures up unpleasant images of human manipulation and exploitation of nature to serve the whimsical needs of arrogant human beings who perceive ourselves as the center of the universe endowed with the right and the power to dominate and subjugate everything around us. On a more benign level, anthropocentrism allows for some considerations of the rights and well being of nature. But human beings ultimately prioritize our own interests when all is said and done. Uh, for some environmental ethicists, unless one adopts a holistic ecosophy such as biocentrism or deep ecology, having other paradigms can easily lead to being labeled as anthropocentric. And these ecosophies generally try to avoid um, anthropocentric tendencies by placing non-human natural entities on equal footing with human beings and calling for the recognition of their intrinsic value um, that must be respected. Now, since religious religions fundamentally focus on the human spiritual condition and the effort to improve it, religious environmentalisms also tend to place emphasis on the human agency in addressing environmental issues. This attention to the role of human beings, however, can be interpreted as perpetuating anthropocentric attitudes and approaches leave, and leaves advocates for holistic ecosophies unsatisfied. Without going into great details beyond the time uh, for this presentation, uh, my thesis in this talk is that despite the obvious focus of religious environmentalism on the human condition and human agency, this doesn't necessarily make it anthropocentric. Religious environmentalism simply recognizes the human epistemic reality that is unavoidable in any human constructed ethical or spiritual vision. So I propose instead that we use the term religious environmental humanism. So um, uh, religious environmental humanism aims to promote environmental well-being by promoting human moral and ethical cultivation and transformation. It recognizes that the effort to care for and protect the natural world is deeply dependent on the human state. In other words, environmental flourishing and sustainability is achieved not despite human beings behaving as humans, but is achieved when human beings are truly human. That is when we live in accordance with our noblest self, which can be realized through the process of self-cultivation. Religious environmental humanism points to the inextricable connection between human spiritual well-being and environmental flourishing. While humanism comes in many forms and all sorts of groups lay claim to humanism and attempt to differentiate their brand of humanism from others, the underlying common thread that runs through all these humanisms is the desire for humanity to become the best possible version of itself, personally, socially, ethically. The hows and the whys differ among the various groups depending on their respective worldviews and metaphysical assumptions. But all believe that when human beings become our best self, it's better for everyone and everything around us. In the Buddhist uh, tradition, and here I'm basically focusing on the Theravada tradition, uh, um, this tradition has often been described as humanistic, partly because it doesn't have a belief in a deity and self-liberation from the cycle of rebirth and suffering wholly depends on one's personal effort to achieve self-transformation. Self but I would argue that Buddhism is humanistic, not because it is atheistic, but because it aims to achieve exactly what I have stated above, that human beings become the best possible version of ourselves while living our earthly life. 
in success, if successful in this effort, we will be rewarded with being reborn with a better human status in our next life or being reborn in some uh, one of the various uh, heavenly realms or even entering Nibbana, escaping completely from samsara, the, the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. The Buddhist tele teleology of escaping the cycle of rebirth and the suffering associated with mundane existence, which can only be achieved over countless lifetimes and can only be achieved in the form of human, means that humans must strive to eliminate the spiritual poisons of greed, hatred, and delusion that cause us to experience suffering and become trapped in samsara. Briefly, um, greed is the mental state in which we are unceasingly plagued by a feeling of need and want along with a constant feeling of lack in our life. Hatred comprises a whole range of negative emotions such as disappointment, despair, anxiety, and dejection, and feelings of dissatisfaction towards ourselves and others. Delusion is a state of confusion and lack of directions in life causing us to fall victim to false views that result in ideological dogmatism and fanaticism. To overcome these poisons and gain liberation, the Buddha proposed practicing the Noble Eightfold Path, which combines moral virtues with development of concentration and wisdom or insight. The eight factors are often listed as right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right living, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Now, the sila group consists of right speech, right action, and right living. The samadhi group includes the right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. The banya group consists of right view and right thought. The diligent training and practice of these three stages uh, uh, results in higher moral discipline, higher consciousness, and higher wisdom, which is the condition that directly opposes the ignorance that give rise to human suffering. To achieve the ultimate goal of wisdom, one must go through the training of the moral discipline, which serves as the foundation for training of concentration, which in, in turn serves as the foundation for training of higher wisdom. The ultimate result of this process of cultivation of moral and intellectual virtue is the attainment of Nibbana, where perfection has been achieved and the process of rebirth has permanently ceased. Ibana is the summit of this very gradual, painstaking process and not an ontological shift or soteriological quantum leap. Intellectual as well as moral progress as prescribed by the Noble Eightfold Path is compulsory for the attainment of enlightenment or the emancipation from the cycle of rebirth. How does um, the Buddhist effort at personal transformation relate to the issue of environmental flourishing and sustainability? As Buddhist self-cultivation aims to help improve our interior qualities, uh, this improvement will be manifested in our relationships with other people as well as non-human sentient beings and the natural environment. The environmental crisis in the Buddhist assessment represents primarily a human ethical and spiritual problem in which humans are plagued by the poisons of hatred, ignorance, and greed. Human-human and human-nature relationships motivated by these three poisons are characterized by violence and exploitation, and in the case of the natural environment, wanton destruction. Fundamental Buddhist teachings, along with the practices prescribed by the Noble Eightfold Path, not only help one to attain spiritual progress, but also help to build human-nature relationships that are wholesome and mutually beneficial. So first, self-cultivation helps humans to feel a sense of solidarity with nature in a world inflicted with unceasing suffering. In the Buddhist cosmogony, since beginning this time, human beings and nature have coexisted on a cosmological continuum linked by the common experience of suffering. All sentient beings share with each other the experience of suffering, albeit in different degrees. Thus, suffering is not a product of subjective human psychology, but an objective phenomenon experienced by our sentient beings. Reflecting on this reality, human beings can realize our connection with nature and develop a sense of solidarity with the suffering nature. Thus, the mitigation of suffering of other sentient beings become intimately tied to the goal of eliminating human suffering, because as the late monk Buddha Thad remarked, Human beings and other natural entities are mutual friends 
in inextricably bound together in the same process of birth, old age, suffering, and death. Even though suffering is strictly within the circle of sentient beings, empathy for sentient beings demands that the non-sentient entities, uh, each, for example, the physical environment which serve to support sentient life must also be cared for accordingly. Second, self-cultivation can promote the human nature relationship of responsibility and accountability, which is based on which is based on um, one of Buddhism's most important doctrines, the law of dependent origination. This law uh, asserts that all things in the universe arise or cease, not uh, uh, on their own, but dependent upon a specific set of conditions. In the human situation, the law is observed not on a physical, observed on a physical psychological level, while in nature, the law plays out on a physical level. The environmental implication appear when it is recognized in this uh, universal natural law, a connection between the human actions and the internal and external consequences exerted upon human beings as well as the natural world. Second, self-cultivation uh, can promote, sorry, um, the Buddha on numerous occasions highlighted this connection in his sermons. For example, in one sermon, the Buddha said that when people behave degenerately, the world would experience social and political conflicts and natural calamities. However, prosperity and peace returned and natural balance was restored when people reformed and abandoned their evil ways. Understanding the principle of dependent origination therefore facilitates building human nature relationship char characterized by responsibility and accountability, where human beings by virtue of their unique mental and spiritual ability can affect the process of giving rise to or extinguishing suffering in the world. Finally, self-cultivation helps promote the human nature relationship of mutual service and gratitude. The vision of this human nature relationship is inspired by the central Buddhist teaching that nothing in the world possesses a permanent intrinsic self. This doctrine of non-self states that there is no self-existing real ego entity, soul, or any other permanent substance, either within the bodily and mental phenomena of existence or outside of that. Reality is comprised of mere continually self-consuming process of arising and passing physical and mental phenomena and that there is no separate ego entity within or without this process. The life which we experience is merely a composite of various mental and physical components or aggregates existing in various configurations, which only last momentarily and is entirely disconnected from the next configuration. The Buddhist insistence on not self in mundane entities, human or otherwise facilitates envisioning a more harmonious human nature relationship characterized by selfless virtues. Oftentimes, uh, obsession with the self leads to egotistical tendencies and attempts to demand rights for oneself, to build up oneself and to protect oneself while justifying why the minimum of rights and privileges ought to be accorded to others. The Buddhist claim of non-self on the contrary opens up the possibility of building a human nature relationship based on mutual service and gratitude. Service rendered by nature on behalf of human beings are many, in addition to providing nourishment and air for humans uh, to sustain our life. One of the unique services um, that nature facilitates is the human activity of meditation on the Dharma. Natural settings are extremely beneficial um, for self-cultivation because they not only create fewer distractions when it comes to sense pleasures, but also provide a natural experiential ground for realizing impermanence and dependent arising. That is the nature of the world. Consequently, a human nature relationship characterized by mutuality, reciprocity, and symbiosis naturally requires human beings to respond to nature's outpouring of service with our own modes of service. Buddhist self-cultivation as prescribed by the Noble, uh, Noble Eightfold Path enables us to possess virtues that promote the human nature relationships described above. The environmental crisis caused by human exploitation and destruction of nature can be rectified when, hum uh, when human virtues are 
intentionally ordered towards improving the way human beings relate to the natural world. First, the relationship of solidarity uh, in suffering can be nourished by the virtues of loving kindness, compassion, and gentleness. The relationship of responsibility and accountability will be strengthened by the virtues of moderation and contentment. The relationship of mutual service and gratitude is supported by the virtues of generosity and giving. Generosity is the antidote for greed and attachment considered to be an essential quality of a superior person alongside other important qualities of faith, morality, learning, and wisdom. Now I turn to uh, Confucian environmentalism. The, um, the Chinese tradition of Confucianism serves as an important spiritual, cultural, and social foundation for a large segment of people in and from Asia. The other well-known tradition from China, Taoism, is also considered to be complementary to Confucianism. They interpenetrate each other so much that these two religious and philosophical systems may be considered two aspects of a single religious tradition. For the past three to 4,000 years, Confucianism has shaped the spiritual and ethical ideals, values, and behaviors of the Chinese people and beyond through its teachings on the veneration of ancestors, its educational program in history and culture, its principles for cultivating harmonious family and social relations, and the grounding of moral teachings and ethical principles in a religious or cosmic reality. In the past, as well as in the present, personal, social, and political warfare and strife motivated by greed and thirst for power have caused disharmony and moral decline in every level of human society. And now these problems are compounded by the escalating ecological crisis. The Confucian response to this human condition is to devise a comprehensive and integrated method for human beings to transform ourselves from the inner core starting with the individual undertaking a self-effort, realizing that what is uh, doing is for the sake of one's own perfection. According to Du Weiming, the foremost contemporary Confucian thinker, Confucian self-transformation is first and foremost for one's own sake so that one can become authentically human. This Confucian learning, however, must not be interpreted as mere acquisition of knowledge or the internalization of skills or a quest for individual happiness or inner spirituality. Confucian learning takes the individual as the starting point of departure. But in this project, uh, the individual is not, a self, is not an isolated individual. Rather, uh, the individual is the center of an interconnected and ever expanding network of human relations. The community comprised of family, village, country, world, and cosmos. According to Du, self-realization as a communal act presupposes a personal commitment for harmonizing the family, governing the state, and bringing peace to the world. The full realization of personhood entails the real possibility of transcending selfishness, nepotism, parochialism, nationalism, and anthropocentrism. So the Confucian comprehensive and integrated program for self-cultivation must include not just self-development, but also give due attention to the four interconnected relationships in human life, self, community, nature, and heaven. Confucian humanism seeks to an integration of body and mind, a fruitful interaction of self and community, a sustainable and harmonious relationship between the human species and nature, and a mutuality between the human heart and the way of heaven. What does a Confucian authentic personhood look like? Um, important traditional Confucian concepts uh, such as Renly and Junxi are essential concepts when speaking about the fully realized person. The virtue of Ren has been translated variously as benevolence, humaneness, love, and kindness. Nado translates Ren as co-humanity because etymologically, the Chinese character for Ren shows two parts. The left part refers to something human, and the right side is ca the character for number two. Together, Ren suggests a quality of being in co-human relationship. As stated by Manzi, to be human means being co-human. The late famous American scholar of religious studies, Houston Smith, translates the term as human-heartedness. 
Although rent is innate, it must be naturally developed under guidance, not coercion. According to Smith, Confucius viewed rent as the virtue of virtues, so sublime and transcendental. Ren involves simultaneously a feeling of humanity towards others and respect for oneself, an indivisible sense of the dignity of human life wherever it appears. Such largeness of heart knows no national boundaries. For those who are Ren endowed know that within the four seas, all people are brothers and sisters. Li proceeds directly from and is integrally connected with the Ren. While Ren represents an interior disposition, Li represents an external performance in daily acts. Li is translated as a ritual or ceremonial living. Other scholars have translated the term propriety or decorum. Thus, Li can be understood as the proper patterns of behavior that each person must demonstrate in one's social environment. This means that Li acts as a governing principle not only in religious settings, but also in non-religious situations. Confucius taught, do not look at what is contrary to Li, do not listen to what is contrary to Li, do not speak what is contrary to Li, and do not make any movement that is contrary to Li. According to Confucius, Li could be mastered by anyone because the inclination to live harmoniously with everyone exists naturally within every individual. Li then is the externalization of the Ren in a specific context, in the experience of living out the various relationships in the community, cultivating personal life, regulating familial relations, ordering social affairs, and bringing peace to the world. Junsu is the paradigmatic model of Confucian personality that embodies the highest standard of social and moral excellence. This term is in traditional Confucian culture is generally applied to men and is translated as gentleman or superior person. Feminist thinkers have translated the term as exemplary person. Two women emphasizes the inner dimension of the individual by translating the term as profound person. Thus, Jimsu is a well-cultivated person, not having any of the characteristics of pettiness, mean-spiritedness, boastfulness, coarseness, vulgarity, and narrow-mindedness. Rather, among other things, the Jimsu is poised, gracious, competent, and courageous. The two inseparable defining qualities of a Jimsu is being well-educated in the arts and literature, history and the rites, and possessing admirable character traits, especially Ren. The great Confucian thinker of the Ming Dynasty, Yang Yang Ming, described this as the unity of knowledge and action, where how one behaved reflects the kind of education one received. One of the greatest things that Jingzi is able to do is engage in continuous critical self-examination, which allows the Jingzi to penetrate the inner self and is able to realize the true nature of human relatedness. The three Confucian concepts of Ren, Li, and Jinsu aim to depict uh, the highest state of human authenticity, integrity, and realization. When a person imbued with Ren consistently demonstrates this inner virtue in Li, the individual is rightfully considered a Jinsu, one that is truly human. Authentic humanity in the Confucian understanding is never egotistical, narcissistic, or anthropocentric. Rather, a well-cultivated person is always conscious of the four essential dimensions of the shared human experience, self, community, earth, and heaven. This integral awareness results in actions and interactions that build harmony at all levels from the home to the world and beyond. An essential element of Confucian humanism is the commitment to relationship of the mutuality with the way of heaven. The heavenly way and the human way are distinct, the former being superior to the latter. Thus, human beings must open our heart and mind to the ways of heaven, lest we become misguided in our actions. The ecological implications in Confucian environmental humanism are profound. The moral education called for by Confucianism helps each person to become truly human, seeing ourselves as central of ever-expanding concentric circles of relationships, beginning with the family, but reaching to the entire cosmos. 
if nepotism is detrimental to the harmony in the family and chauvinistic nationalism is contrary to patriotism, then anthropocentrism is also detrimental to achieving human flourishing. According to Tu Wemin, the vision of harmony at the local and cosmic levels demands that human beings see ourselves as being both socialistic and naturalistic, that we cannot be just anthropological or anthropocentric, but anthropocosmic. That is seeing ourselves beyond mere socialistic or materialistic qualities. Thus the project of self-cultivation must include a transcendent vision that doesn't limit us to the mundane world, but to aim for unity with heaven and embracing the entire universe. The human person is comprised genetically of vital energy, life, and consciousness, and the human nature is endowed by heaven. Thus, self-cultivation can help us to emulate heaven and become active participants and co-creators in the transformative process of heaven and earth. By taking part in this creative process, we enter into communion with heaven and earth in a tripartite relationship. Winsett Chan commented, if one word could characterize the entire history of Chinese philosophy, that would be humanism, not the humanism that denies or slights a supreme power, but one that professes the unity of man and heaven. Major Neo-Confucianist thinker Chang Sai's Western inscription contains these opening lines. Heaven is my father and earth is my mother. And even such a small creature as I find an intimate place in their midst. Therefore that which fills the universe, I regard as my body and that which directs the universe, I consider as my nature. All people are my brothers and sisters and all things are my companions. Indeed Chang recognized that all entities in the universe share the same life force of Qi, which refers to uh, yin and yang, and the five phases of wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. This common life source established co co consanguinity between human beings with the rest of nature. This holistic worldview espouses that everything in the universe is constituted of the same life force. Because human beings share the same life force as nature, human beings could communicate with nature and observe happenings in nature to discern our own fate. Rulers could observe natural phenomena to decipher whether their mandate of heaven is being blessed due to virtuous relationship or about to be taken away due to moral depravity. Although the idea of mandate of heaven was originally envisioned in a political context to explain and justify political fates, Confucian thinkers broadened the concept to include moral destiny, moral nature, and moral order. Anthony, Thus, in the um, context of Anthony, ecology, Anthony, we can say that humanity is mandated by heaven to partake in the tremendous task of cosmic transformation as co-creators. This unique role as co-creators place human beings in a favorable, favorable position to feel a special bond to both the natural sphere and the transcendent. The Neo-Confucianist philosopher Wang Yangming says, the great person regards heaven and earth and the myriad things as one body, regards the world as one family and the country as one person. As to those who take a cleavage between objects and distinguish between self and others, they are small persons. That the great person can regard heaven, earth, and the myriad things as one body is not because one deliberately wants to do so, but because it is natural to the humane nature of one's mind to do so. Therefore, empathy and compassion are extended not only to one's kin or fellow human beings, but various entities in nature as well. This moreover is a defining trait of every human person. This is consistent with the mentioned thinking that human hearts are naturally inclined to be sensitive to suffering of others. Confucian philosophers point out that we naturally feel empathy for a child who hurts himself, but we also feel empathy towards animals who are about to be slaughtered, plants that are destroyed. We sometimes even feel pity to see tiles and stones shattered and crushed. In this cosmic perspective, we realize that, that all entities in the universe can be seen as part of one's kinship network and we can apply the rule of reciprocity to all our dealings with others. Never impose on others what you would not choose for yourself. Ultimately, what each person aims to do is to be in perfect harmony with both heaven and earth, 
as stated in the doctrine of the means. Only those who are the most sincere can fully realize their own nature. If they can fully realize their own nature, they can fully realize human nature. If they can fully realize human nature, they can fully realize the nature of things. If they can fully realize the nature of things, we can take, they can take part in the transforming and nourishing process of heaven and earth. If they can take part in the transforming and nourishing process of heaven and earth, they can form a trinity with heaven and earth. So I will stop there. I think my time is probably over by now. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.